Welcome to It's Your Dime, a straight talk interview series presented by Shift Gold. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. In this episode, I'll be talking to journalist Chris Powell. Chris is one of the founders of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, that's GATA.org. In this episode of It's Your Dime, Chris and I discuss how governments and central banks attempt to manipulate the gold market, why they try to rig the markets, what GATA learned when they sued the Federal Reserve, why the mainstream ignores this story, and why it's important for precious metals investors to own physical metal. Well, I am happy to be here today with Chris Powell. He is one of the founders of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, better known as GATA. And uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion today about manipulation in the gold market. So uh, how are you today, Chris? How are things? Oh, uh, very good, Mike. Good to be here with you. Well, I appreciate it. So I'm going to start off the interview, as I always do, with uh, the leadoff segment that I like to call, Who Are You and Why Are You on My Show? And uh, this is just basically your opportunity to, to tell the audience a little bit about your background, uh, just generally who you are. And I always like for the guests to include at least one thing uh, about themselves that has absolutely nothing to do with this interview. Well, I'm uh, Chris Powell. I'm the secretary and treasurer of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. Uh, I've been uh, in the newspaper business in Connecticut for 50 years as a reporter, uh, an editor, uh, gave up the editing work uh, a few months ago. I'm just a columnist now for uh, the Journal Inquirer in, in Manchester, Connecticut. At uh, GATA, we uh, uh, track, document, uh, complain about and sometimes uh, sue over the uh, largely surreptitious intervention in the gold market by governments and central banks, uh, which is undertaken generally to suppress the gold price, protect government currencies and, uh, and bond prices. Uh, we've been at this since uh, uh, January 1999. We've uh, amassed uh, uh, an enormous amount of documentation of this longstanding central bank policy to suppress the gold price, push it out of the world financial system. Uh, we brought a couple lawsuits about it. The lawsuits have uh, elicited uh, some pretty interesting information. Um, and we, uh, uh, we, we, we try to bring this, uh, uh, this policy to the uh, uh, attention of uh, the uh, financial news organizations, the mining industry, uh, uh, people in the financial markets uh, generally uh, we find that it's uh, uh, the information is not well received. I'm shocked that that it's not well received, and by shocked, I mean not surprised at all. Uh, so, one thing about yourself that has nothing to do with the interview. Oh, I used to play softball a lot. Uh, it was a, a player and a coach on uh, two teams. I haven't done it for a few years because I've been too busy with uh, newspaper and got to work. I'm I'm hoping after we've uh, destroyed modern central banking, I can go back to softball next year. <laughs> that's a that's a worthy goal on both both ends of that <laughs> spectrum. I play hockey in my my free time. So uh, <laughs> it's always good to have something outside of, of what you're doing to take your head out of the out of the what I'm sure can be very frustrating. So you you gave a little bit of uh, overview of God a bit. Uh, give us a little bit deeper uh, insight into the organization and how you guys got started. Yeah, our uh, organization really started out of uh, commentaries that were uh, written back in uh, late 1998 by our chairman, Bill Murphy, who runs an internet site of financial commentary called lametropolecafe.com. Uh, I stumbled into his uh, internet site uh, back in 98, uh, uh, very soon after it got started. And uh, he was uh, pointing out evidence of what seemed like manipulation of the gold market by investment banks, uh, it was pretty compelling to me, um, but I thought he was missing something. Uh, I had experience in the newspaper business with antitrust law, so I, I wrote him that uh, if what he was observing, uh, or what he thought he was observing, uh, was correct, uh, it was uh, against the uh, Sherman Act and the Clayton Act, and 50 uh, state antitrust uh, acts here in the United States, and that uh, 
uh, somebody should start a committee uh, to uh, hire some uh, law lawyers on a contingency basis and uh, sue the, the bastards for triple damages under uh, antitrust law. I further told them that if uh, uh, anybody wanted to start such a committee, I would donate $500 to it. Um, Bill thought it was a good idea and we, we started the committee. Um, it uh, took us about a year or so of research before we discovered that the uh, real perpetrators of the gold price suppression scheme were not the nominal perpetrators, that is the investment banks trading in the futures markets uh, were really acting only as, as agents of the US government and, uh, and other governments. Uh, our uh, lawyers uh, looked into that and discovered that the uh, Gold Reserve Act of 1934, as amended in the 1970s, actually fully authorized the U.S. government through the Treasury Department and its Exchange Stabilization Fund uh, to uh, secretly rig not just the, uh, the gold and uh, silver markets, but uh, to intervene secretly and rig any market in the world. Uh, as a result, our lawyers told us that uh, there really wasn't much chance of defeating this uh, scheme through, uh, uh, through litigation, though we, we did try in, uh, in 2001 and had, had at least some informational uh, success there. Uh, but insofar as market rigging, secret market rigging by the U.S. government is uh, completely legal, um, the best we can do is uh, is try to expose it because it uh, it still relies on de deception uh, and uh, and and the ignorance of uh, the markets, the ignorance of the the public. If uh, if if this market rigging is ever exposed, if people ever fully understand what's going on and and how the rigging is being implemented, uh, the rigging won't work anymore because uh, nobody will uh, will play the rigging game and. Uh, I think the scheme will be defeated. So uh, uh, that's really what we're 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 after. We're we're trying to expose the scheme to an audience wide enough uh, that the scheme uh, collapses from exposure. Absolutely fascinating. It actually sounds like something that should be like the plot of a movie. <laughs> you know, you're talking about central banks and governments and manipulation of markets. And uh, I'm afraid Danny DeVito would play me. <laughs> Well, I, that wouldn't be all bad, I don't guess. But um, so when you talk about market rigging, can you give the audience, uh, and this may be difficult because I'm sure it's it's uh, somewhat technical and complex, but can you kind of give an overview of how this works? I mean, how, how in the world do central banks rig a gold market, something that's uh, ostensibly a global kind of thing? Well, they, they used to do it uh, very candidly and openly through something called the London Gold Pool, with, which functioned throughout the, uh, the 1960s. It was a coordinated scheme uh, by uh, Western central banks, uh, the United States, and uh, I think about seven central banks in Western Europe uh, to uh, disord uh, as much of their gold reserves as necessary uh, through the gold market in London to hold the gold price at the official U.S. price of $35 an ounce. Uh, in uh, early 1968, as inflation built up in the United States, uh, the offtake from the London gold pool uh, increased so much that uh, the uh, uh, Western central banks were losing their gold reserves so fast as people realized that gold was ridiculously underpriced. Um, the United States realized it had only a few months uh, uh, gold reserves left at the current rate of offtake. And in March 1968, the United States asked the Bank of England to, to shut down the London gold market. And that was the end of the London gold pool. Uh, after a few years, uh, the Western central banks regrouped and realized that they uh, better could control the gold price and, and, and rig the currency markets uh, through derivatives by creating futures markets. And a gold futures market was indeed cr created in the United States in early 1974. Uh, and since that time, the Western central banks have, have used the selling uh, of gold futures to uh, uh, control the price. Um, with the selling of gold futures, uh, the central banks do not have to disord as much of their real metal. Uh, it's a much more efficient way of controlling uh, the gold market as long as 
uh, investors, people buying gold, are content to buy imaginary gold, that is paper gold. Um, this is how the price is being controlled now uh, by the virtually unlimited emission of gold certificates uh, that are purported to be backed by gold, but in fact are not backed by gold at all. There's been testimony to the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission that the ratio now of, of paper gold, uh, certificate gold, to real metal uh, is as much as 100 to 1. Uh, a few years ago, the Reserve Bank of Indi India did a, a study that concluded that the ratio of imaginary gold to real metal in the markets is probably around 92 to 1. Um, now, as long as people are uh, very happy to accept a piece of paper that says gold on it as representing uh, real metal that they can get anytime they want, uh, central banks and their uh, allies and the bullion banks can create infinite amounts of, uh, of paper gold to suppress the price with. Uh, the scheme falls apart if gold investors ever realize that if you cannot hold the gold in your hands, you don't own it. Uh, that if you're buying paper gold or some of the exchange traded funds in gold, uh, you might as well flush your money down the toilet because you're you're just letting people create imaginary gold for price suppression purposes. So just to emphasize, there's a lot more paper out there than there is actual metal. That, that's pretty much what you're saying, correct? Yeah, but it's a you know a, a fractional reserve gold banking system that has just gone to extremes, according to uh, the experts. Uh, uh, you know, you're 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 not. I mean, we used to have a gold cover in the United States when the uh, the dollar was convertible to gold of something like 40%. You you had to have a 40% gold coverage for your currency. Well, you know, <laughs> there's apparently now there, there's not even, you know, a 1% coverage uh, of gold for uh, the paper gold that's circulating out there. Um, but it's been, you know, very successful for central banks uh, uh, for, for many years now. They've been able to uh, inflate currencies and... Uh, uh, conceal the inflation that they have uh, been creating because uh, they've got the gold price under control with paper gold, with imaginary gold. Uh, they've basically uh, blocked the exits from the uh, financial system for people who are looking for a hedge against inflation, other than by investing in, uh, in the inflated stock markets, which is where the central banks uh, want all their excess money to go. Right. So really, it's just a matter of supply and demand. I mean, obviously, if you've got at least the impression that there is a lot more gold than there is, that's going to keep the price lower as, as you flood a market with the supply. Uh, the, the market response is to lower the price. So if you flood the market with paper uh, that's purported to be gold, it's going to hold the price of gold down. So it's 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 when you look at it in those terms, it's pretty easy to understand exactly what you're saying. It's uh, you know, even though you're dealing with a world market and it, and it sounds like a technical thing, it's really basic economics. Yeah. You know, gold bugs like to say that, you know, gold's great virtue as a currency is you can't print gold, but you can print gold. Central banks do it all the time. They they lease gold, they swap gold, they, they backstop the uh, uh, paper gold emissions of uh, the bullion banks that are their, their agents. They have created a vast imaginary supply of gold. Uh, certainly you can't print the real metal, but you can print the paper and deceive people into thinking that the paper represents real gold. Right. So here's the $64,000 question that I'm sure a lot of people are asking. I mean, uh, we can see the technical mechanism. We can see how they could do it, but why are they doing it? Why? What's the benefit to the central bank and, and the government uh, for manipulating the, uh, the gold market? Well, gold is a uh, competitive currency. It competes with every other currency in the world. Um, central banks uh, don't want their currencies uh, to go out of fashion. Uh, what if everybody realized that, you know, gold was a superior currency and that government currencies were uh, always devaluing? Well, then people would get out of government currencies. They'd get out of government bonds because they would realize that the uh, currency represented by the bonds uh, was uh, devaluing. Um, Governments need to destroy gold, to push it out of the financial system, to, to discredit it in order to protect their own their own currencies. Now, gold is is also uh, a, uh, a determinant of interest rates and government bond prices. That's 
uh, pretty much uh, longstanding uh, economics. Uh, in fact, there was a uh, very uh, telling meeting in the uh, office of uh, U.S. Secretary of State Henry, Henry Kissinger back in April 1974. He was meeting with one of his uh, assistant secretaries, Thomas O. Enders. Enders was explaining to him why the United States had to continue its policy of pushing gold out of the world financial system and particularly of uh, preventing Western Europe from uh, doing anything that might remonetize its gold reserves uh, in, in any way. Uh, Enders explains to Kissinger in, in the minutes, or really the transcript of this meeting, which is on the internet site of the State Department's historian, uh, that uh, Europe now has more gold than the United States uh, does in its gold reserves. And this is very dangerous to the United States because whoever has the most gold in the world can revalue it from time to time. And in revaluing its gold, uh, it can change the value, control the value of all other currencies in the world. And if the Europeans start revaluing their gold uh, and, and returning it to the financial system, they can affect the valuation of the US dollar. And this will greatly diminish uh, United States power in the world. Um, that's why the United States at that time and hence has always tried to uh, disparage gold, suppress its price, push gold out of the world financial system, discourage uh, other nations from uh, from remonetizing it or, or increasing its, its use in the financial system. Now, we see that uh, this policy is uh, you know beginning to to fail other countries particularly russia and china have uh, realized uh, that the gold price suppression scheme is against their interest they are accumulating gold reserves uh, even uh, uh, countries that are not hostile to the united states have been uh, repatriating their their gold reserves from the united states have been been buying gold lately uh, the rest of the world realizes increasingly realizes anyway that that uh, uh, if it wants to use the dollar as the world reserve currency, it will be, to a great extent, the slave of the United States. We see the United States now uh, weaponizing the dollar with, uh, with sanctions and, and uh, driving out of the world financial system anybody who, who uh, contradicts uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Other countries are realizing this. They'd like another world reserve currency, but their own currencies are are not strong enough. Uh, the euro is uh, is weak, and Europe politically is falling apart. Uh, China is a big economy, but it's a totalitarian economy. Uh, its uh, currency, the yuan, is is not convertible. It's it doesn't have a big enough uh, market yet. Uh, so the yuan is is really not suitable as a alternative world reserve currency. Uh, but you know the. The world reserve currency we used to have, gold is always suitable. Everybody uh, recognizes gold as, uh, uh, as an international form of, uh, of money. Uh, it doesn't uh, have any uh, uh, national hallmark on it. Uh, you can use gold as currency without being the slave of any particular country. And I think that's really where the world is uh, slowly moving. Yeah, it's really interesting that, that you bring that up. You you hit on several topics that I've written about extensively on the uh, Shift Gold website, shiftgold.com slash news uh, over the last few months, particularly the weaponization of the dollar, uh, the, the movement we're seeing in uh, some other countries uh, trying to figure out alternative payment methods, uh, and even, you know, our, our historical allies. It's, it was really interesting not too long ago, the, uh, the EU, announced that it was uh, going to create an alternative payment system in order to circumvent uh, U.S. sanctions on Iran. So I, I think you're seeing a lot of countries that are kind of tired of being uh, at the mercy of the U.S. and the mercy of the U.S. dollar. And uh, I, I saw an article not too long ago, about 10 percent of the physical gold uh, demand over the last year. So since the beginning of 2018 has actually been central bank buying. And as you mentioned, primarily uh Countries like Russia, uh, China is probably still buying uh, metal, although they don't, uh, they're not real transparent with that. But uh, even a couple of EU countries, Poland and Hungary, just uh, bought quite a bit of gold. So it's definitely something that you're seeing uh, in, in today's in today's system. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things going on that you can see that that back up what you're saying. 
Now, going back uh, a number of years, GATA was involved in a couple of lawsuits, and you mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, tell us a little bit about the the legal wrangling that you guys have been through and uh, what that revealed. Yeah, we've brought uh, two lawsuits uh, in regard to gold price suppression. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, uh, the first uh, we brought in 2001 through our uh, uh, lawyer and, and plaintiff in the case, uh, Reginald Howe, in uh, U.S. District Court in, uh, in, in Boston. Uh, Reg had uh, owned some uh, shares of the Bank for International Settlements, which is the the gold broker for for the central banks. Uh, we sued the uh, the BIS, uh, the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. Federal Reserve, the major uh, bullion banks, uh, charging them with uh, with gold price rigging. Claimed that gold price rigging was uh, illegal, at least the, the the way they were doing it. Um, there was one hearing in that case. I attended it uh, in Boston, uh, and. Uh, uh, an assistant U.S. attorney got up to argue uh, for a motion to dismiss the lawsuit. Uh, he uh, uh, maintained uh, that uh, the United States government claimed the power to do exactly what the lawsuit complained of uh, and that the suit had to be dismissed because what it accused the government of doing was absolutely legal under the Gold Reserve Act of 1934 as amended in the 1970s. Um, the, uh, the judge did dismiss the lawsuit, but he dismissed it on a, uh, technical jurisdictional grounds. Uh, he, uh, argued that, uh, that Howe did not have jurisdiction to sue, uh, but that maybe a mining company, a gold mining company would have jurisdiction to sue. It was really kind of a, kind of an evasion of the, uh, of the issue, but the, the, the lawsuit was notable in my opinion, uh, for, uh, a listening and admission from an assistant U.S. attorney that the U.S. government does claim the power under the Gold Reserve Act to secretly rig the gold market to keep the price down. Uh, I thought that was a you know pretty telling admission that uh, uh, really uh, vindicated what we'd been uh, been saying for our uh, uh, limited lifespan back uh, back then. We uh, brought a second uh, lawsuit, uh, uh, a Freedom of Information lawsuit against the Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, oh boy, uh, I'm, I'm guessing about 10 years ago, I can look it up for you, but uh, we wanted access to the Federal Reserve's uh, gold-related documents. The, the Fed didn't want to give us their, many of their gold-related documents, so we, we, we sued in U.S. Uh, District Court for the District of Columbia. Now, uh, in the uh, uh, haggling over the documents the Fed did not want to give us, uh, we uh, got a letter from a member of the Fed's Board of Governors, Kevin M. Warsh, who was acting as a, sort of a, a hearing officer on our Freedom of Information complaint. Uh, Warsh wrote to our lawyers that uh, uh, among the documents that the Fed was refusing to uh, let us see uh, were records of its gold swap arrangements with foreign banks. This was an admission that the Fed is in the gold business. That is, that the, 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 the Fed is at least contemplating swapping gold with other banks and the, the central banks uh, or possibly bullion banks. And the only uh, reason for the Federal Reserve to have gold swap arrangements with other banks is for market intervention. So we, we know from uh, Fed Board Governor Warsh's letter to our, our lawyer that uh, the, the Fed is at least contemplating uh, intervention in the gold market through intermediaries with, uh, with gold swaps. Um, as it turned out, uh, the judge in that case ruled that uh, we won the case uh, because one particular document that the Fed had refused to give us, which was uh, kind of the minutes of the G10 Golden Foreign Exchange meeting, I think back in the late 90s, uh, should have been uh, released. It was not exempt under the law. Uh, that uh, uh, document with the minutes of the G10 Gold and Foreign Exchange uh, meeting showed uh, central bankers meeting secretly and uh, trying to discuss and coordinate uh, their policies in, in the gold market. Uh, the judge said that document should have been released to us since it was not released to us. Technically, got a defeated the Fed uh, in its lawsuit in U.S. District Court 
in the District of Columbia, and the uh, court ordered the Fed to pay Gata something like $2,500 in court costs. Um, so we did get a check from the Fed drawn on the Federal Reserve Bank of, uh, of Richmond for something in the area of $2,500. Uh, it is uh, uh, posted uh, like a moose head on our internet site, uh, a proud trophy that uh, you, know, you, you can beat City Hall and that we did uh, force the Fed to uh, disclose uh, that it's uh, more involved with the gold market than, he want, than it wants the world to believe. It's uh, interesting to me the hoops that you guys had to jump through and, and the legal wrangling that you had to endure just to get information from you know, the government. And, it, and it's an indication of just how often uh, things are not exactly transparent. I have a little bit of experience uh, in this realm of, of my own. Uh, I've tried to get some information from my local government about surveillance cameras, and, and I ended up actually getting sued by the city <laughs> because the uh, uh, they didn't want to give up those documents, and the attorney general uh, said that they should hand them over. So I'm still involved in that lawsuit a year, or a year later. So uh, that's pretty fascinating. I, I, I want to emphasize this to, to people that are watching. Uh, this sounds a little bit tinfoil hat, you know, kind of thing, like it's uh, – uh, one of those things that's kind of crazy, but if you go to gata.org, check out their website, they have all of this documentation. Uh, and, and you can look at, you know, a lot of the evidence that they have gathered over the years. And, uh, you know, I, I think on the website, you talked about, about the idea of a conspiracy, but, you know, just because you say conspiracy doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. Right. No, you know, the government is by definition, uh, largely a conspiracy. A conspiracy is, uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, going on in, in, in secret. Um, people say conspiracy theory when we talk about the secret intervention of the gold market by governments and central banks, but uh, the uh, you know government holds secret meetings. Uh, you're not permitted, I'm not permitted, the public is not permitted to attend the monthly meetings of the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, neither are we permitted to attend the monthly meetings of the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, well, when uh, uh, government officials uh, gather in secret and uh, uh, discuss and implement policies made in secret, that's the very definition of conspiracy. Uh, now, the difference with us is that uh, uh, there, there's a difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracy fact. When we have the, the minutes of the secret meeting of the G10 Gold and Foreign Exchange Committee, that was not noticed, that we were not invited to, that's conspiracy. Uh, when we have the uh, uh, monthly reports of uh, uh, the Bank for International Settlements uh, showing uh, their trading in, in gold uh, derivatives, uh, uh, well, we don't know how those trades were authorized and for what purposes. We did a year ago ask the BIS, uh, why are you involved in the gold market? What are you doing exactly and for whom? And what are you trying to accomplish? Well, we, we got a very quick reply from the BIS explaining that they never explain anything. Uh, that's conspiracy, folks. Uh, you know, I, I just don't understand why people think that uh, conspiracy theory is some disparagement of, of anybody who complains about the government acting in secret. Right, absolutely. So you guys have really been one of the one of the things that you've tried to do is to get this into some, you know, get mainstream attention. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that you have uh, presented the evidence that you've gathered to mainstream news sources. Uh, and I've heard about some of this stuff, to be honest, reading alternative, uh, you know, quote unquote, alternative media sites. But uh, I haven't really seen it reported on extensively by uh, MSNBC or or uh, Fox Business. Why do you think it is that the, the mainstream just doesn't seem to be interested in something that to me is a uh, a kind of blow your socks off kind of story. This is a national security matter, Mike. Um, the uh, uh, true location and disposition and use of government gold reserves uh, are secrets far more sensitive uh, than the location and disposition of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons can only destroy the world. But uh, as uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Enders told Secretary Kissinger, at the State Department in 1974, uh, gold can control the world because with gold, 
you can control all the currency and commodity markets. In fact, with, with the control of gold is the control of the valuation of all capital, labor, goods, and services in the world. There really is nothing else. Gold has to be kept in a very uh, locked box by governments or central banks or economic freedom and, and personal liberty might break out throughout the world and that can't be permitted. So as your average average guy sitting out there or gal watching uh, this video right now, and uh, you, know, you may be invested in the stock market, you may be interested in the gold market, um, you know, what, what's kind of the takeaway from your point of view, uh, just for your average man on the street, so to speak? I mean, obviously, one thing that, that is pretty clear to me is that uh, you're, if you're, if you're going to invest in gold, you probably want to invest in actual physical metal and uh, not some of these paper products that are out there because you, you may be getting uh, absolutely nothing backing that paper. But, uh, you know, just on a broader scale, what does this mean to your to your person that's interested in precious metals? Well, you know, it certainly means what you just said, that, you know, if you can't hold that gold, you don't own it. It's, it's phony. Uh, and you might as well flush your money down the toilet. But uh, in, 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 in the big picture, uh, uh, I think it means two things. First, you know, there, theoretically, there's an enormous investment opportunity here. If there's a, a short position in the monetary metal of uh, something like 90 or 100 to 1, uh, if there is ever a short squeeze, if uh, uh, enough people ever realize that uh, most of the metal that's been sold in certificate form doesn't exist, uh, you can imagine what the price would be. Uh, certainly, if if everybody uh, tried to exchange uh, their paper for physical, uh, well, then you know the pr price presumably would be a hundred times what it is now. I mean, governments. Uh, uh, would freak out at that that prospect, uh, but uh, uh, also uh, it, it it means that uh, we don't have free markets. Uh, that our our markets are illusions in uh, in in this world at, at at the moment. Governments are are rigging not just the gold market, but but all the commodity markets. So uh, we we have the filings of uh, the CME Group, where the futures exchange operator, with the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, showing that governments and central banks are uh, among the uh, CME Group's uh, clients, that they are trading secretly in, in all the major futures markets. Indeed, we, we have the uh, uh, volume trading discount price schedule for governments and central banks, which we found posted on the CME Group's own internet site. Uh, have you ever seen it reported that governments and central banks are are secretly trading all major futures contracts in the United States and getting volume trading discounts from CME Group for doing so. That's never been reported. Uh, did you know that they're, they've arranged even to trade cattle futures? Why are governments and central banks getting discounts uh, for trading cattle futures? Because they want to control the, the commodity complex to defend uh, the, the, the dollar, their currencies, uh, government bond prices. Anyway, the, 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 the big point here is this, this market rigging is, is comprehensive. We no longer have free markets, even here uh, in the United States. We, we have a, 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 a fairly hidden totalitarian system when we, we come to the markets. And that uh, uh, this, well, uh, th this could be uh, really what Orwell foresaw in, in 1984. Uh, he uh, has uh, one of his characters there, uh, the secret policeman, uh, explaining that if you want a vision of the future, uh, just imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Well, that's what we've got here. Uh, uh, we're, we're not free people unless uh, markets are free. Uh, we're, we're not free people unless we know what, what the government is doing uh, to control us and to control uh, uh, economic values. Uh, that's really the, uh, the bigger conclusion that, uh, that I draw here. It's not that I, I care so much for a uh, a pretty yellow colored uh, metal uh, uh, gold is is important only uh, insofar as its functions are respected uh, and those those functions uh, uh, facilitate uh, human freedom and free markets and that's why gold is important uh, it's not important because uh, it looks nice around the neck of a pretty girl <laughs> although it does <laughs> I mean we have to we have to admit right <laughs> 
All right. So I've got one more question for you. This is this is my key question. It's one that, you know, I kind of use it to determine whether or not you're going to be allowed back on the show ever again. But when you're typing, particularly for something that's going to be published online, do you double space after every sentence? Well, I haven't done that. Maybe they taught me how to do that uh, in high school when I was uh, taking my first typing class, uh, which was a disaster. <laughs> but uh, I'm a very good typist now, uh, Mike, and uh, uh, I, uh, I do not use uh, double space after a period. This makes me very happy because if I ever had to edit, well, I'm sure I wouldn't, but if I ever did have to edit something that, that you wrote, I wouldn't have to go back and fix all of that, which is a um, big waste of an editor's time. You right? might have to fix other things, but not that. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time and being on. Uh, before you go, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, uh, first off, add anything that, that you might want to add that you've forgotten, and also to let people know where they can find all things GATA. Uh, so web links, uh, social media, whatever, whatever you've got that you want people to be able to find. Oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, our internet site is gata.org. Uh, we uh, typically, on an ordinary day, we, we may publish uh, email several dispatches related to the financial markets that might be of interest to, uh, to people who have an interest in, in the gold market. Uh, uh, we welcome uh, people signing up for our email dispatches. You can do that in the right column of our, our internet site. Our internet site uh, has sections not only for our daily dispatches, but it also has a, a documentation section. So really the, uh, uh, the proofs of uh, central bank intervention in the gold market are uh, set out separately there so people can find, uh, find them more, more easily. We are a uh, nonprofit uh, uh, educational and civil rights organization. Uh, uh, what the, the Internal Revenue Service recognizes as a 501c3 organization, which uh, means that uh, financial contributions to GATA in the United States are, are federally tax deductible. We uh, uh, welcome donations from uh, gold investors, people who uh, believe in, in free markets and limited and accountable government. Uh, uh, we could not survive uh, without uh, without th those donations. We really don't get much from the mining industry, which uh, uh, finds us uh, uh, inconvenient for, for, for selling gold and silver shares right now. They're uh, not so much interested in, in getting the price of their product up, I'm afraid. Uh, but we, we do uh, solicit financial donations to support our research and our, our publicity and uh, our, our occasional uh, litigation. There's a mechanism on our internet site for, for making contributions to us by credit card. We welcome checks uh, as well. Um, and uh, if people are looking for particular information that uh, we may have or they think we may have, uh, we welcome their inquiries. They can email me at uh, cpowell at gat.org. Our generic address uh, is info at ghana.org. Uh, we're very glad to uh, uh, be a clearinghouse of information for people. Well, Chris, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I think this is a, an important issue, and I'm sure that you've opened a lot of people's eyes. I would encourage everybody who's watching to visit uh, gata.org and uh, take a look at all of the resources and information that are that, that, that's there if this is all documented uh, and uh, you know it seems far out when you're listening but when you when you go to the website and you see these documents and you see what uh, the government officials have actually said uh, it's it's pretty clear that this is uh, most certainly going on so uh, again chris thanks for your time and thanks for the work that you're doing and uh, i appreciate you being on oh thanks very much for having me with you all righty. You've been watching It's Your Dime, an interview series presented by Shift Gold. For more information on investing in gold and silver, talk to a Shift Gold precious metal specialist today at 1-888-GOLD-160. That's 1-888-465-3160. Or visit us on the web at shiftgold.com. You can keep up with all of the latest precious metals news at shiftgold.com news and tune in each week to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap podcast. 
This is your host, Mike Meharry. I appreciate you watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.